Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another edition of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast with me, Harry Simiou. I've got Mike Stavry with me because it's a big, big day in the Arsenal world. Mike, first of all, how you doing? Yeah, good. Uh, Better before this morning. (laughs) It has been a mad day. When you work in this industry, Harry, you know that you can be ready at the drop of the hat to to cover a story like this. So it's exciting, but um, scary as well, I would say. Absolutely. As you can see, I'm not at home. I'm not in the studio settings. Um, Apologies for the, the sound quality if it's not great, but we thought the timeliness of this episode was probably the most important thing given the news that we've heard today. Um, I gave some instant reaction on an episode uh, this morning with regards to the news that Eddie was leaving, but at the time of recording that, there was no news about what had happened, where Edu was going. It was just, boom, Edu's leaving Arsenal, and we were left to try and pick up the pieces and figure out exactly what had gone on. Mike, what's your understanding right now of the situation? Because we've read a few reports, obviously, The Athletic, for whom you work, of put the story out um, just not that long ago, actually, that he is going to join uh, the Nottingham Forest group along with Marinakis in charge. Um, Mm. The Independent have put a piece out through Miguel Delaney that kind of explains that maybe there was a bit of a frustration on Edu's part because he wanted the role that was not given to him. How do you read this situation at the moment? Yeah, so obviously... I think there was rumours of this that um, that came about um, a few months ago, but it wasn't anything that was substantiated. So I was very shocked when I read it this morning, but I think we've been seeing speculation flying about about Eddie's uh, position. So it has come as a shock, but at at the same time, I've kind of I've kind of seen the news this morning and gone, okay, it's it's that time um, and it's reached that stage. Um, so, so yeah, as you mentioned, the Athletic have reported that. Um, he will be leaving. We're not sure on a time or, or date yet. We, it's not even signed yet, um, but it's very much expected that he'll be joining uh, Marin Agis's group, which involves uh, not only Nottingham Forest, but obviously Olympia Goz and Rio Ave in Portugal. Um, so it sounds like, and um, obviously information is scarce on this, so we're kind of just piecing it together. Um, but it sounds like he's going to be a sort of overseeing those three clubs maybe in a sort of similar way to how Jurgen Klopp is operating at Red Bull um sort of overseeing the multi-club uh, model which um Marin Nagis has um so on the surface of it when you see Edu going to Nottingham Forest you might think okay that's a massive step down but if you think that maybe you know he's overseeing a whole bigger operation which might involve more responsibilities than than just one club maybe it starts to make sense. But from an Arsenal perspective, I think it's a big blow. Um, There are some mitigating factors in that. I think maybe we do, you know, overplay the role that a sporting director uh, has, possibly, uh, just just recently. But I'm sure we'll get into that on the show. Yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, from an Arsenal perspective, just speaking purely as a fan, I feel really, really frustrated by this. This is a guy who has been one of the leaders in this project. He's been at the forefront of this operation that has taken Arsenal from essentially being on their knees as a football club to one of the most powerful and best teams in Europe again. And that's taken a long time. It's been hard work. There's been tough decisions that needed to be made. I always felt like, at least looking from our point of view, that the dynamic between him and Mikel Arteta was really good, that they were on the same page enough to be pulling in the same direction but also they're both big enough characters to be able to challenge one another when maybe there's a questionable decision being made or there's something that really requires a lot of thought and a lot of um, consideration. For him to keep talking about the long-term nature of this project, for him to uh, be as sort of open with the fans as he's been, and I think he's done a great job, by the way, of of making that connection. I don't think sporting directors are always very good at that, They're men in suits to us as fans. But Edu seems to, obviously, being an invincible, being a former player, he already had the hearts of all the Arsenal fans. But, you know, I've interviewed Edu and I felt like he was really warm and someone that I could really get behind. So taking all of that into consideration, and I know things change and I know circumstances Mm. change and I know we're not privy to everything that goes on behind the scenes. I was really, really, really disappointed. Now, we suspected that he was going there. But I was really, really disappointed to read um, 
the post from David Ornstein, what, an hour ago, not even that, half an hour ago, where he said that Arsenal sporting director Edu agrees to join group controlled by Nottingham Forest owner Evangelos Marinagi. He's not signed and the role still to be finalised, but he's leaving Arsenal for a new post, includes responsibility for growing the operation. OK, I'm sure, Mike, uh, there's going to be more money on the table. I'm sure this is a really lucrative offer. But to abandon this project at this point, when it's so close to going bang, and I'm using Arsenal's own terminology here, feels really, really frustrating. And I've got to be honest, I've lost a bit of respect for Edu here. I know from, from his personal perspective, there's probably justification for it. There's probably a lot of money on the table and it probably makes sense in a number of ways. But as an Arsenal fan, I can't help but feel disappointed by him here. Look, I'm, I think it's a, I think it's a really difficult one because I, I, ultimately, if we'd gone on and the project had been completed, i.e., winning the the Premier League or the Champions League, we might be looking at it slightly different. Um, and maybe he thought, you know, that was going to come a bit earlier, so it wasn't part of his his plan necessarily. Maybe he thought, okay, I'll win, you know, the title, win the Champions League, and then I'll 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 go. Um, but you know, in football, I think these these opportunities don't always come around all the time. Maybe he's you know trying to look after his own career. Um, I mean, it's obviously it's completely disappointing for us because I think he's you know rebuilt the club in a way you know not by himself but with the processes that he's put in place. Obviously, starting with um, getting rid of Emery and bringing in Arteta, you know that has obviously laid the foundations for all of the su success that we've had. I'm not going to say that it's been perfect. You know, he's made some mistakes uh, in in the transfer market. You know, I think of. Pablo Mari, Cedric, some of the earlier ones, Willian, um, David Luiz, you know, there's not, it's not all been hits. They've not all been Declan Rice's. They've not all been Martin Odegaard's um, and they're not all been Gabriel's. So it hasn't been perfect. Um, so I think we have to, you know, be balanced about that and say, look, he's had a tangible impact. We can see that because of the manager that he's brought in and the, the players that he's brought in. But you'd like to hope that with, the changes that he's made structurally um, and that the Cronkies have made as well, you'd think that one person going out wouldn't completely, you know, let everything go to ruin. Uh, you'd like to think that by his work, he's put in a framework that will allow us to continue the great work that he's done and bring in someone else. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see whether we promote, whether we promote from within or whether we go for someone external. Um, Cause I think it's going to be key what role Mikel Arteta um, takes on now? Because will he, will he, you know, take on more responsibility because Edu's gone and he was his right hand man in terms of, you know, talent ID? Would he get involved in that more in terms of, you know, really getting involved in that that transfer side of things, or will he, will we get someone in that does exactly the role that Edu does and he can sort of continue on in his more head coach role? That's going to be really interesting for me. But obviously. Um, the timing isn't great, is it? I think that we we all have to acknowledge this has come at a time when our title challenge is looking a bit ropey. I mean, I text you after the the Newcastle game saying, "For Christ's sakes, like, no, this is bad. This is this is." And you were in Wolverhampton at at the time, so it wasn't wasn't a great experience for you. Sorry to remind you of that, by the way. But I think if the timing was slightly different, we might be looking at this differently. But I completely understand yours and everyone's frustrations at the moment. Yeah, the timing is is bad um, because it feels like the club is in a weird place at the minute where the performances on the pitch are not great. We've dropped eight points in three league games, which is just not acceptable when you're challenging for this title. I don't want to make, let me, let me rephrase that. I say not acceptable. Uh, what I mean by that is it's not something you can get away with. To say it's not acceptable suggests that I hold Arsenal to this standard where they have to win every single football match. And I know the game doesn't work like that, right? But we're in a, a turbulent period where our title hopes, as far as I'm concerned, right now are gone. Um, gone. That doesn't mean gone. I don't. That doesn't mean that we can't recover them. Mm. But right now, I don't consider us in the title race. If we put a run together and we manage to claw ourselves back into it, then that's a different story. But as of today, we're out of it, and it's on us now to try and fight our way back into it. But at a time where we're dealing with that where there's question marks around some of the summer recruitment. Mikel Marino, I know it's early days for him. He hasn't been a hit, and I'm sure we could do a whole other podcast on him. Calafiori's had a few injury problems at the beginning. Raheem Sterling was brought in and isn't called upon, even when we're desperate for a goal, which doesn't make an awful lot of sense to me. It feels like we're in a place right now where 
there's a lot of questions being asked. And then to top that off, the one thing that we did have going for us was this stability within the football club and the sporting directors leaving to join a group that are nowhere near, um, even with three clubs on their books, the size of Arsenal Football Club. That's the reality of it. Um, I was reading Miguel Delaney's piece. I know, I think you mentioned this earlier on. Um, my connection just dipped um, ever so slightly, but they're looking mm. to triple his wages, apparently, um, mm. which is massive. Um, and mm. it's understood that, well, according to these reports, that he wanted the role of CEO at Arsenal. So is this a case of Edu getting to a point where he doesn't feel the progression is there for him and he's taken this decision to move on elsewhere? I, I don't know. I just think I'd rather be the sporting director of Arsenal then overseeing a load of clubs that let's be honest, Mike, we're both from Greek backgrounds. We understand what <laughs> Marinagis is. He could change his mind tomorrow. Like it, it just, it, it doesn't feel like a good move for Edu. Um, you know, when you think about everything outside of the financials and maybe the financials are what's dictating this and driving him to, to make this decision, but it just feels weird to me. The next question, I guess, is where do we go from here? Because there's lots of mm. problems on the pitch right now. There's clearly some issues off the pitch as well. And I don't want to be overreactionary. I, I realise I've sounded like that over the last few days. But, like, where do we go from here? Like, sporting directors, it's not like we make lists of sporting directors that we want, like we do in the summer when we're looking for players. So what happens yeah. next? Do we even have a sporting director? Does the structure change? I don't know. Well, you'd hope that, you know, the club have known about this for a while and and they would have known that, that it's coming. Obviously, we don't have that information, but you'd hope that Edu would have indicated earlier on than, you know, 10 games into the season that he was possibly looking at moving on. And you'd hope in that situation that we would have a list of of um, people drawn up. And look, it's not like, you, like you're right to say, it's not like transfer targets. It doesn't quite work like that because it's about the whole vision of the club and the, and the structure and where they fit in. So that's why... You know, we might be looking at, a, at an interim. Um, you know, could it be given someone like Per Mertesacker, who's currently the head of academy, obviously knows um, knows the setup very well, knows Mikel very well, has worked, you know, played with him and, and worked with him closely. Is it a situation like that where we look to promote someone from a footballing standpoint? Or do they go with someone like Richard Garlic, who's been doing a lot of the... Uh, the transfer side of it in terms of negotiations and things like that? So I think they've got two two or three you know options here do they look for a footballing person do they look for someone who's more on the business side of things or do they look externally at you know a more established sporting director um you know we've had them in the past we've been linked with with monkey and and um and other people like that and obviously we had um who's the guy at dortmund remind me that we had uh mislin tat Mislin Tat, yeah, we've had him as well. So do we go for someone who's more established in that realm? Um, that is a question that that we can't answer right now, but I think it's going to be interesting to see which direction we're going. I, but I just want to like go back to this point on sporting directors and then this might you know, be a theory for Edu's exit is they're kind of like celebrities now in a way that they weren't before. I think, you know, if you'd, you know, five, six, seven years ago, would you have known who the sporting directors were at a lot of the big clubs? Probably not. I mean, you look at Manchester United and, you know, they sit there in the director's box and they're all lined up, aren't they? Omar Barada, Jason Wilcox, Dan Ashworth. Um, they're almost as, you know, bigger profile as a lot of the managers these days. Um, and when we look into it, I think it's not really as simple as it is for a manager who, you know, picks the team and has a direct impact on the football on the pitch. I think the sporting directors, they obviously set the vision and they work in bringing in the players, but then it's up to the manager and the players themselves to actually implement that. So maybe is there a situation when we give them too much credit? Um, I don't know. That's a difficult one, isn't it? But maybe Edu has seen the shift in the landscape and towards sporting directors being, you know, more in demand. And he's thinking, I need to think about my own, you know, per career progression at first and, and, he, and he's putting that as a priority I, I don't know it could be the case I, I agree with you around the role of sporting directors I think a sporting director doesn't need to be as hands-on as maybe some people seem to suggest that they are I think they can be people that just have oversight like I don't expect a sporting director to identify every single transfer target I don't expect the sporting director to be involved from the very beginning right until the end of every single negotiation. I think they'll oversee it and I think ultimately they'll have a big say. But I do think you're right. Like we do maybe overplay that role a little bit. My problem is though, Mike, is that we have 
sold this project to the fans as one that is built around stability, youngish guys all pulling in the same direction and with that view of it being a long-term thing. And I know things change, right? In any industry, someone can have their head turned and end up taking another job. And you can never really um, hold people to full account when they say, I'm going to be here for the next however many years. But then when it goes wrong and there's no communication, and there's been no communication from Arsenal on this, which is mm. really frustrating, I think. I'm sure they're getting their ducks in order. I'm sure they're trying to figure out what the best way to do this is. And I'm sure they would have liked it to come out after they had figured out what the next step was because people feel a lot more confident don't they when you come out and say we're losing x but we're going to replace him with y or the structure is going to change or whatever you want a solution not just a problem as a fan you want to hear what the next steps are and if you can come out and communicate that really quickly when the news breaks then people go okay it worried me initially but the club have got a handle on this the club know where they're going with this so you know i'll just relax a little bit and I'll trust in their ability to get this right. There were murmurings as well, Mike, in the summer, wasn't there, of some frustrations and some disagreements at the top of the club. For example, mm. we heard that when Arsenal were looking for Mikel Marino, not everybody at the club was on board with that particular transfer because of his age, because of the contract that was on offer and the price that it was going to take to get him out of Real Sociedad. So now looking back on that, do we think that Edu may have been and I know we're speculating, but do we think he may have been one of the people that perhaps disagreed with that move? Is there a chance that the issue is not just with him not being CEO, but that him and Mikel Arteta are maybe no longer completely aligned as they were previously? Is that a possibility? Well, of course, it's a possibility. I think it's, uh, as you say, it's really hard for us to know how the how the inner workings of, of these things happen. Um, I will say that, you know, Edu's role has changed a lot over time and i think arteta's role has changed a lot over time um so there is a possibility that you know as their status grows as you know the, the situation of the clubs change that they that they have disagreements on things uh that's that's completely possible um and i think it's the the more important thing is that it shouldn't really affect us in january because you would have thought that they would have been doing a lot of the groundwork before that uh, to, to the January window, and to be to be fair, we've been pretty quiet in January windows in general, haven't we? Over over recent years, the part where I would worry is we need to get someone in as soon as possible because, as we know from when you know we we did the stories on the Athletic about um, our pursuit of Rice, we know that started early. That started you know around the what was it around the World Cup or maybe January. So that though these talks happen. Um, so if we're already looking at next summer. Um, and it's going to be a big summer again because we're we're probably going to need to add a few players and we're going to be challenging again, we hope. Um, that's when I will be concerned because we need a proper structure in place to identify these players and, and be able to even get the, the contacts established and you know all the things that go into a, a modern transfer these days. Um, so that will be my concern, really, the, the quickness of, of the appointment. And as you say, you don't really want space for people, you know, like us, like a lot of fans, to speculate on on what's happening and and you know, is this a disaster and you know, is the season over and blah blah blah. So, I think it's uh, important that the club act quickly and uh, and resolve this situation. Yeah, completely agree with that. I mean, we've got Inter away on Wednesday. We'll bring you some coverage from that game, by the way, from Milan. I'm going to be out there. I'm heading out there on Wednesday morning. Uh, so we'll probably bring you, um, if not some pre-match, definitely some post-match on the Thursday. I don't come home till the Thursday night, so I've got the whole day uh, to do some work out in Milan, which will be cool. Um, but then we play Chelsea away on Sunday. And if we were to drop points at Chelsea, which I don't think we can afford to do right now, then all of a sudden you look at Arsenal as being way behind in the title race, sporting directors leaving, questions over the recruitment, questions over the fitness of key players. And you all of a sudden, the mood around the club, which has been a big mm. part of why the atmosphere has been so enjoyable in recent times, is because everybody feels good and on board. And when we have ha have had minor setbacks, because of the general mood, people have been able to bounce back nice and quickly and keep that moving. But all of a sudden, you're in a much deeper hole than you have been at any point over the last three years where you would argue this project has really started to take off. So, yeah, there's a there's a big concern here, Mike. And you're right. It, the club don't want 
people like us sitting there discussing it and trying to figure out what comes next and they'll try and act quickly but also if they haven't got anything in place you know this is the thing we know that these stories don't always come from the club sometimes they they put mm -hmm. things out there and they see them through but sometimes these stories get picked up by journalists through various sources and sometimes the club can be in a position where they're scrambling to try and deal with the mess that comes of it. And I feel like in this situation where there's been no statement from the club at the time of recording, no official communication, we can only assume that that's been the case here. Yeah. And uh, it's a, it's an exclusive by Sammy Mockbell as well. So we've got to give him credit, yeah. uh, you know, fair play on that. It's a, it's a good scoop. Um, and yeah, you're probably right on that. And, yeah, you're you're bang on about the the current situation, and I've been feeling it really for a, for a few weeks. But I think it was the the Bournemouth result that really set it off, and this negativity and the sort of need to jump on performances and jump on individuals is something that you know we felt um, under Arteta a few years ago, um, and it's not it's not a feeling that we like. It's not a feeling we enjoy, and I think it's because we're used to being so good. Um, and you know, that, that result against Bournemouth, it was our, it was our first away defeat in the league, um, in 2024. Yeah. And, and so you, you know, you match that up with another one the following week and you start to worry because you think, you know, this solid foundation mm -hmm. that, that we've had, um, you know, this really solid mentality that we've built is starting to ebb away and that. That performance against Newcastle, Harry, I know you've you've spoken about it on this channel, but it was really worrying because we didn't see the mentality that we've always been able to fall back on when we've not particularly been playing well in games and when we've had key players out. We've been able to, you know, use this rallying cry and, you know, that Arteta has been able to galvanise the team to at least get a point. The fact we didn't see that, the fact we didn't really see any fight back at all, um, you know, zero shots on target. No, I, I saw a stat that... Our, Four backs didn't overlap once in the game. Like that is all concerning for me. And it puts so much pressure on this Chelsea game now. Because not only is it an, a tough game against a team who, okay, they didn't play that well against Manchester United at the weekend, but they are on the up and they're also our rivals. So I feel like, uh, uh, you know, anything but a win there is going to be seriously damaging. Um, and to me, it's frustrating because I don't feel like, and as we saw at the weekend, Man City and Liverpool are in the best state right now. One of them, you know, losing key players in Man City and they obviously lost for the first time since December 2023 in the league. And then Liverpool have got a new manager and I know they've started very well, but, you know, they're not the team that they were under Jurgen Klopp. So I feel like on the project that we're on and the, you know, the trajectory that we should be on, it should be us really in Liverpool's position right now, taking advantage of, you know, rivals dropping points and, and we're not. And that, that hurts. It, it, it does. So I think, you know, bringing it back to Edu and, and the club, I really think we need a bit of good news right now, whether that comes on the pitch or or not. And I think, look, if we'd been talking about a win at Newcastle and, and bouncing back after Bournemouth, we probably would be having a different, you know, slanted conversation right now, wouldn't we? We'd be a bit more, you know, okay, Edu's leaving, he's done fantastic work, but we're going to get someone else in and we've still got the title challenge. But I think because it's all come at once, maybe why we're feeling slightly worse about it. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Um, Mike, I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. It's been a great conversation um, about Edu's imminent move uh, to the uh, Marinakis group, Nottingham Forest, Rio Ave, and uh, who's the other one? It's bloody gone out of my head. Olympia was, obviously. How could I forget how them? How could you forget? Uh, yeah, how could I forget them? Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, how this develops. Um, not great news, I don't think. I don't, some Arsenal fans have been online and saying, well, you know, this is great news because he's made so many dud signings and he can't sell players and all that. I think all of that is a load of nonsense, to be honest with you. Feel free to disagree with me. But I just think when you look at where the club was and where it is today, yes, have there been some misses along the way, of course, as every sporting director has. But generally speaking, I think he's done a massive job. He's been a massive part of a real levelling up at Arsenal Football Club. And, and for that reason, he had my respect. I'm not sure he's got it all now, though. Um, given where he's going to. If, if you know, just speculating here, if Barcelona came in and said, Edu, we want you to be our sporting director, or Real Madrid came in, or Bayern Munich, or Inter, or one, one of the European powerhouses, right? I would go, fine, I get it. You've got Arsenal back to a level where you feel they're competitive. That's job done for you because you're, that was your remit. Um, you've come in, you've done that, you've managed that. Congratulations to you. 
and I get why you'd want to join one of those football clubs. I just can't get my head around this one. And when I think about it, it's only going to be because of money and status in terms of the position. But is the CEO of that group a bigger position than the sporting director of Arsenal? I don't think it is. So that's where my frustration comes with Edu. Um, but yeah, just just final thoughts on this before we wrap up. Yeah, look, I think it's um, it's a difficult one for, for us to understand because if you look at the the status of the clubs, um, if you look at the the trajectory that they're on and you look at the fact that he's helped to build a lot of this and, you know, we're not just talking about us becoming a, a serious outfit again, but I think the, where, you know, bar the last few games, we've been in a really healthy position the last two, three years um, and, and we're on the up. So I always feel like it's weird to leave a project when it is going in, in that direction. If you've reached that peak and as I said earlier, you'd won the Premier League or won the Champions League, then that makes sense to to sort of drop off and say, okay, I'd like a new challenge. When it comes, when you're almost at that, you know, peak, but you're not quite there, I think that's where the frustration lies. And that's that's where I understand it. I feel that too. I feel like if he would have seen it out and if he would have got us to where we needed to get to and then said, you know, thank you very much. Um, I've really enjoyed this, but it's time for me to try something else. I would have said, yeah, fair enough. Or as you say, if he would have, you know, been snapped up by Real Madrid. That's not a possibility that you can say no to um, as someone in football. But the fact it is, you know, Nottingham Forest, Rio Ave and Olympia goes, it it does leave a bit of a bit of feeling. I've seen a lot of stuff on Twitter about, oh, they've got more European Cups than you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is, is that my, my dad was probably in nappies when those European Cups. Yeah. Uh, well, one, but anyway, anyway, um, we'll leave it there. But uh, just a quick announcement before we go, um, just to confirm that the Chronicles of Aguna has uh, signed Mike Stavrou. Uh, we'll be doing a regular weekly show together, which I'm really looking forward to. Mike's um, been involved with the pod for a long, long time. You're my one of my favourite guests to do pods with. We always have great conversations. Um, he's a top producer as well, so he'd probably tell me off about some of the uh, the sort of production bits and pieces. But um, yeah, Mike, it is an absolute pleasure uh, to have you on board weekly. We'll be doing um, these types of shows, but we'll also be doing some Patreon bits and pieces uh, when we record as well moving forward. So really, really excited about that. Mike, um, welcome and uh, thank you for agreeing to do it. No, it's been so fun, mate. And look, it's been, you know, since we met back in the day at, um, at Love Sport Radio and you were coming on the Arsenal Fan Show, uh, you've come a long way. Uh, you know, you're doing amazing things. And I've been really, really glad to be involved in this project from very, very early on uh, when you were still doing your old job as well and you were still sort of doing both of these things. Um, mm -hmm. And you. you remember when I I used to work from home and like be like, I've got a slot of half an hour. I got no meeting and get away with it. <laughs> so, so look, and look, that was a, that was a big life decision. Maybe that was, that, that was your edu moment, you know, <laughs> maybe you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to move on to something else. Um, but yeah, no, it's been really fun to, to be involved in this project and, and yeah, I can't wait to be doing it more regularly. No, it's a pleasure to have you, mate. You've you've done amazing things as well. It's great to see. And um, yeah, really looking forward to making this show on a weekly basis we've got to come up with some kind of name for it i mean we've both got beards can we go with something beard something to do with suvlagia because we clearly <laughs> both a fan of those i don't know we'll figure something out over the coming weeks but mike uh thank you as always uh we'll be back with another episode of the chronicles of aguna podcast tomorrow hopefully there isn't some major breaking news to come uh, this evening because i really haven't got the brain capacity to do a third episode uh in a day but uh, we've got a preview coming up of the Inter game. Daniele Fisichella, uh, Italian football expert, will be joining me tomorrow to give us uh, the download on our opponents on Wednesday night. So uh, looking forward to that chat. I'll see you all on the next one. Uh, until then, take care of yourselves. Goodbye.